four. Okay, just a few of you. So here's the thing. It, Don said it, I'm gonna repeat it. Uh, this is hopefully unlike other conferences in that you have access to the real people and it's really meant to be conversational. So the slides are really just you know, meant to be things you can interrupt on and say, hey, what about this or what about that? And that also then set the, sets the expectations that the, the, it's, it's actually a good thing if a speaker doesn't get all the way through their slides. Uh, you'll see them say, oh, you know, that was a great conversation. Yeah, this stuff's not important. Let me skip to that stuff. That's good stuff. When you see that, that's things working correctly because then it's engaged, okay? Because otherwise you could just watch this stuff on, on YouTube and, and that's not the point, okay? So what we're gonna cover, the past, present, the future. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so the history. Uh, so I joined Microsoft in 1999. I was what they were called an industry hire. Bill Gates said, hey, we're kind of screwing up on this management stuff. Let's see about getting somebody who can help help us with that. I immediately began pushing saying, hey, we need an administrative management model. That means command line interfaces and scriptable shells, uh, interactive and scriptable shells. Um, there was some pushback to this. You know, command line interfaces at Microsoft, I had an executive to ask me the question kind of pointedly, exactly what part of fucking Windows is confusing you, Jeffrey? <laughs> and uh, at some point I had someone say, I know, admins want GUIs, they don't want command line interfaces. And I asked, ah, you know, what did you do before you came to Microsoft? And they said, well, I came here from college. I said, yeah, I knew that. Okay. <laughs> so there was a very, very, very strong cultural uh, uh, pushback against command line interfaces because Microsoft had been doing just so well on GUIs, if they could make a problem about a GUI, they won. And so they wanted to make everything about GUIs because, man, they were just the dominant GUI vendor. Um, and so finally we pushed, and a number of us pushed, and got the services for Unix, right? These were uh, um, you know, using the POSIX subsystem, you know, Bash, Shell, all that good stuff, uh, running on uh, Windows. We tried to get it included in Windows, came that close. But in the end they said, well, you know, we're not 100% sure that IP is pure, uh, let's make it a free download, okay? So problem solved, and the answer is absolutely not. Uh, this is a complete, uh, well, not quite disaster, but it didn't help at all, the services for Unix. And why for that? Why was that? And the answer is this difference, this kind of core architectural difference between Windows and Linux. Linux is a document-oriented operating system, and Windows is an API-oriented document, uh, API-oriented operating system. And this core architectural difference was the reason why that didn't work, why we had to invent PowerShell, and why you, it explains a lot of the things you see today. For instance, uh, Chef and Puppet. Love good. Steve here from Chef, love Chef. But the reality is these are Unix tools that are doing great guns and configuration management, and then they hit a brick wall when it comes to running Linux or Windows, right? And the answer is because on Linux, all you have to do to be a great management tool is to edit a file. I mean, literally, if you can edit a file and restart a process, you're a Linux management tool. You can do basically anything. Whereas on Windows, that doesn't help at all. And why is that? And the answer is, of course, um, you know, Ockrep said in those worlds, those are text management tools uh, on Linux. Um, because we're an API-oriented operating system, Auk doesn't work against WMI. Yeah? Grep doesn't work against Active Directory. Sed doesn't work against uh, the registry, right? We take all of our managed objects and we put them behind APIs. Now, there may be good reasons for that. There actually are some good reasons for that. But it does mean that you can't manage the system by editing text documents, okay? So that's why we ended up having to invent PowerShell. So now, talk about command line interfaces and WMIC. So originally, we tried to get the Unix tools on Windows fail. People continue to take Windows tools, put them on uh, Linux tools, put them on Windows, and fail. They often think that they're succeeding, and the reason why is because there's one part of management, one part of Windows which is is document oriented, and it's a quite important one, and that's IIS. So when these tools get on Windows, they go and they write, "Oh, I can manage websites." very, very important, and they think, yeah, look, I can manage my tools, my architecture works on Linux, on Windows, and of course it doesn't, because that's the only thing you can manage using, using documents. All right, so WMIC. How many people have ever used WMIC? 
Oh, wow, that's a surprise. That's a delightful surprise. Okay, so originally um, I did WMIC thinking, well, the problem here, we have, we've got a couple problems. One is, need command line interfaces. Second is, the value proposition for writing a WMI provider was really quite low, right? I, I believe everything works through economics, right? Say, you write a piece of code, if there's no economic benefit for having done so, that guy's not gonna repeat what you just did, right? Because why would he? So, you know, Perfmon's the perfect managing tool because you do a little bit of code, Perfmon goes up and down, everybody's happy, you show it to your boss, people love it, um, but then products, third-party products can come in, take advantage of the same Perfmon counters. So that's a perfect example of a management product. So I wanted to do something similar with WMI because in fact the answer was you write a WMI provider, really, really hard code to write, and then what? And the team would say, well then uh, third-party products like Tivoli can take advantage from you of it and deliver value to customers. It's a, I said, well, yeah, except guess what? You hired me from Tivoli and that's what my job was and I know exactly what it can do and it can't do any of the things you're saying. So, so that's not true at all. So basically we had an environment where when you wrote a WMI provider, nobody was getting any value. So I said, well, let's do this. Let's do it so that if somebody writes a WMI provider, they should be able to get a command line interface for free. And that's what WMIC was. So we wrote this, and when we originally did this, the program manager said, oh great, we'll just go write a, a bunch of scripts against <laughs> WMI. You know, one per now. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. I have to have a common engine. And they're like, no, that's hard. I don't know about you. When, when I grew up in the industry, when someone would say, oh, that's hard, that was like, oh, cool, I'll do it, right? <laughs> hard was like the reason why you did something. And then somehow, you know, guys have proved what a great programmer you were. Somehow things changed and hard became a reason not to do things. That was a very odd thing for me. Anyway, no, that's hard. Let's just write a single script for each one. I said, nope, we must do it this way. And so we did. Uh, so we had this common engine that then processed the metadata. And the reason why I was so hardcore about this was because of test. At Microsoft, you can't ship a product out unless you know that it's high quality. How do you know that it's high quality? And the answer is somebody that's got a test name in their title says, I've put some time into this and I assert that it's fine. That's what quality means. And there were so many products that were not being shipped, so many functions that were not being cut because somebody with the name uh, test in their title didn't have time to spend doing this. So I knew that if I wrote a script for every single one of the objects, somebody with a title test in their uh, uh, name was going to have to sign off in each one of those. Instead, what I said, no, 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 I'm going to write a common engine and I'll get somebody to sign off on that, but then that engine's going to be driven off metadata and I'm not going to ask anybody to sign off on that. I'm going to ship that out of band. So that's what we did. Uh, and then this then produced XML and then we transformed the XML, got the WMI objects, got them in XML format, and then we use XSLT to transform that. And in fact, WMIC, I don't know if you've ever played with it, it's really quite arcane, but in fact you can do pipelines of XSLT transforms using WMIC. Good frickin' luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pipelines. Um, so this actually worked incredibly well. So the background was with these command line interfaces was um, I had done two things. First was uh, we had invested $4 million, $4 million in a contractor to write some uh, command line interfaces. I got 60 commandlets out of that effort. Okay, so $4 million, 60 commandlets. Okay, fine. Then we went and said, in addition, I need some extra money. I'm going to do this WMIC. Uh, Jeffrey, you're, you, you came in too late. You already spent the money. There's got to be some money around. Well, it was about $60,000. Okay, well, give me that. So we spent $60,000 and wrote WMIC. So four, th four million, got 60 commandlets. $60,000, I got one, WMIC. But this one commandlet was driven off metadata. So then I spent my Christmas vacation, two weeks, writing this metadata. And at the end of the Christmas vacation, I had 72 commands, that would 72 sets of metadata <coughs> that were then driven off this command, off this one common engine. So all of a sudden, I, my $60,000 investment yielded more than my $4 million investment. 
that was pretty good. And I said, wow, this is really something, this architectural approach here. Let's see if there's some more money. And there was, there was, another, I think, another $40,000. And I went and took that engine, and I gave it more capabilities. And by giving it more capabilities, every single one of the commandlets that I wrote, all 72, got more and more powerful. It's like, holy schmoly, I'm really onto something here. So having the command, this common engine, that then gets more and more capacious, and the more capacious it gets, the more capable that each individual commandlet gets, that was the right thing. So that worked great, except um, you know, we had minimal WMI adoption. Again, it was super, super hard to write these WMI providers, and the value chain was kind of weak at that time. <coughs> so, so it was great, um, but that's as far as we got, ran out of money. So <laughs> then, then along came .NET, and Bill used to just beat up everyone. Bill Gates used to beat up everybody. Get on .NET, get on .NET, get on .NET. And I'd have these reviews with Bill, and he would just beat me up mercilessly about getting on .NET. And I remember thinking, well, you know, we're saying, you know, look, our hair's on fire with this problem, this problem, this problem. I'm pretty sure .NET's not the solution to any of those problems. So I'm sure it's some wonderful technology, but it's really not, I think, what's the solution to what we have. Anyway, he just kept beating me up. So at some point, I thought, well. There's only so many times Bill G is going to kick my ass uh, before he fires me. I better go find out what this .NET thing's all about. And so what I did was I decided I'd take WMIC, and remember I had, I had WMIC produced XML, and then I had these pipelines of XSLT transfers. And in fact, the syntax for that was all wacky, et cetera. So I thought, to, okay, well, look, this .NET, WMI is problematic, not getting a lot of coverage, but everybody seems really excited about this XML. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite WMIC as a generic shell, and I'm going to be base it on anything with XML. So I was going to have pipelines of XML and have processing units be pipelines of XSLT transforms. And so that's what I worked on. And that didn't work out so well. And I just kept thinking, well, XSLT transforms, you know, if you, if you, if you spend enough, a little bit awkward, but if you spend enough time, you'll get it. And turns out that's not true. <laughs> but in the process, I discovered that, well, oh, wait a second, .NET and .NET Reflection gave me about 70% of what WMI was giving me and what I needed from a management obje up, up, object system. So I said, well, okay, well, how about if instead of pipelines of XML, I do pipelines of .NET? And it only gave me 70%, so why don't I make up the rest of that with this synthetic type system? And voila, uh, PowerShell was born. That's how we did it. So uh, as part of this, I started to do some deep rethinking. You know, okay, so I wanted to uh, thought about the most successful, uh, one of the most successful compositional models in the industry. And that's, of course, the Linux compositional model, right? And, uh, you know, this is summed up by A pipe to B pipe to C. And every now and again, it's very worthwhile to allow yourself to step back and ask dumb questions, right? And so I, I stepped back and I said, okay, well, why do people do this? Why is this so successful? What's really going on with this A pipe to B pipe to C? And I looked at that long enough and I finally figured it out. Ah, I got it. You do that because A didn't, want you, didn't do what you wanted to do. A keen insight there, right? Because <laughs> if A did what you wanted to do, well, you just type A. Okay, so this really means A doesn't do what you want it to do. So no big, key, no big breakthrough there. But then I asked myself this question, well, why doesn't A do what you want it to do? Why didn't, why didn't you just make A so that it would do what you wanted to do? And there things got very interesting. And it turns out there's two answers. Now, how many people have a, a Unix background? Okay, so you'll recognize this answer. The answer of the Unix guys will tell you is, this is the Unix compositional model. The Unix compositional model says build small tools that do a discrete task very, very well, and then compose them with other small tools to solve problems. And the point of that is that then, as novel problems come up, you can recompose things and solve them very, very quickly. So the traditional Microsoft model is very scenario-oriented, right? 
I'm going to find out what your scenarios are. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to your coworkers. I'm going to follow you around. I'm going to write down what you do. And then I'm going to know what your scenario is. And I'm going to go off and I'm going to write something for your scenario, right? Three years later, I come back and I have a tool that <laughs> exactly meets your scenario. Here's the problem. 20 minutes after I left, your scenario changed, right? You got a new boss, you had a new insight, something changed. Scenarios are constantly changing. So when I come to you with my fixed scenario tool, you say, thanks, that doesn't help. And the traditional Microsoft approach is, okay, well, let's find out what your new scenario is. I got another three years. <laughs> and the Unix guys are much more agile than that. They say, hey, uh, you have a scenario, I know how to build a, compose a bunch of tools and I can solve that. Oh, it changed, I'll recompose them, solve that problem. So that's the traditional answer. And that's a good answer, but there's another answer. The other answer is this. The other answer is A doesn't do what you want it to do because it tightly binds three steps into one. A gets a set of objects, it processes those objects, and then outputs those objects as text, typically as text. So when we say A doesn't do what we want it to do, what we're really saying is, I didn't get the right objects, or I didn't process the right objects, or I didn't output them as text the way I wanted to. So seen in that light, what you're doing by piping it to B and C is really <coughs> trying to reverse engineer your way back to do one of these steps differently. And this is the keen insight, the heart of the insight between about PowerShell. All I did was say, the pipeline belongs here. Instead of pipelining text, trying to reverse engineer your, object, your way back to the original objects to do one of these steps differently. Let's keep them as objects, operate on them there. The objects actually drive simplicity, because <laughs> text parsing, we call this prayer-based parsing, right? You know, go over, cut off the first three lines, or four, three or four, three or four, four, five, five, cut off five lines, then go over 27 columns, oh, there's a tab. <laughs> Regular, oh God, anyway. So, and pray that you get it right. right. Instead of that, you just say, hey, I got the, this uh, process. Give me the name of the process. Right? So you deal with the objects, and you only output to text when you want text. That's the heart of, of PowerShell, heart of Monad. So we want to have a new administrative model. right? So basically, yes, Steve. Yeah, did we ever consider something like Iron Python, which would be syntactically similar? Nope, not at all. Uh, you know, no. So we, Jim, you want to? We did actually talk to the Iron Python guy who was at Microsoft at the time. Yeah. And decided that it wasn't that that good a fit as we thought it might otherwise be. Yeah, so Jim's saying we talked to the Iron Python guys Jim and Newton it wasn't was a particularly good fit. Jim Hugan was at Microsoft at the time, and we spent a, lot of, a number of hours talking going down that path. Yeah, so let me draw a distinction. So by the way, uh, in the background, Jim Truer, he's going to give a talk. Jim was uh, a co-designer of the language with Bruce Payette. Uh, honestly, you'll see where that fits into the architecture. And uh, I had pretty you know, humble ambitions for the language. And these guys just gave me at least 10 times more than I had wished for. It was just <laughs> unbelievable success. Uh, indeed, there were some other technologies out there, Python, et cetera. Um, and honestly, uh, they, they, they were more focused in on their technology than solving the problem. And so they, they, we didn't think there was a good fit there. If you read Bruce Payette, Bruce wrote a great book, PowerShell in Action. And in it, he talks about how we tried to innovate as little as possible. How we borrowed heavily from Bash, how we borrowed heavily from Python, et cetera. And by the way, at the time, those were the dominant products, Python, or Perl, sorry, Perl and Bash. Python wasn't that popular back then. Uh, Ruby, we were inspired by some of the things Ruby was doing. It was pretty nice. I used to talk about that, and nobody had ever heard about it. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to take that traditional Unix model and then reinterpret it for the Windows environment. So we want to have an interactive shell. Bruce Payette has a great phrase about how the life cycle for more shells starts at the prompt and ends at the carriage <laughs> turn. 
right? Interactive <coughs> shells are very important to investigate things. One to have a set of commands, one to have some text manipulation, and then GUIs and <coughs> admin, admin GUIs on, layered on top of command line interfaces. And very much so, from the very beginning, we knew that there had to be a strong focus in on the economics. Again, things that didn't work in the past were things where people had invested and then didn't feel like there was a good deal. That's not how you get an ecosystem off the ground. Okay. Oh, yeah, reimagine it for this. So I wrote, at the time, we uh, uh, were working with a team in India. In fact, we had a bunch of the program managers in Redmond and then all the development team in India. And that was, uh, what's the word for that? Disaster, yeah, <laughs> disaster I think was the word. And uh, it was a disaster. And part of that was, uh, boy, you just need to over-communicate, over-communicate, over-communicate. Turns out you, sometimes you can't over-communicate enough. Uh, and so there were all sorts of problems with that. But as part of that, I thought, well, you know, we've got to be very crisp about what it is we're trying to achieve. And so I wrote the Monad Manifesto. And the goal of this was so that people understood the problems that we had, our unique approach to solving those problems, and then provide a roadmap for where we were going to go. And the goal was to be specific enough so that it could be actionable, but not so specific that it couldn't be expanded upon. And I think that's actually the, the great success of the Monad Manifesto. One is not just how incredibly accurate it is, has described the last, what, 12 years, um, but how it's acted as a sort of kind of a guidepost of having flown at the right level, specific and yet not too specific. So in this, we basically said, hey, we're going to reinvent the world. We're going to reinvent the world with a, a Monad automation model, a new way to write automation that was far cheaper and easier to do than it has done in the past. We're going to have a new Monad shell, call it PowerShell, a uh, new set of Monad management models, Monad remote scripting, and a Monad management console. Okay, and then described each of those things. But how many people have ever read the, the manifesto? Okay, for the people who haven't, I encourage you to go read it. It is really quite an interesting document, and you'll be able to see kind of step by step how we've filled out the, the pieces. So we're taking a number of new approaches, right, to building commands. This is one of the reasons they're not called commands. They're called command lets. The reason why they're called command lets is we wanted a model whereby we were asking the individual developers to write the code that they and only they could write, and then we do the rest of the work, okay? So that minimizes the amount of investment, right? I was gonna <laughs> knock on somebody's door and I say, hey, I know you're really busy, but I need you to write some commandlets. And they're gonna say, screw off, I'm busy. I was like, yeah, no, I understand you're busy, but I really need to do this. They were gonna say, screw off, I'm busy. And I was like, look, I, this is, nobody else can write this code, and it's not a lot of code, just write it. And then they were going to write it, and they were going to get a big benefit from it. And that's actually what's happened, and continues to happen. We were just having a team a discussion with Dan, smiling in the back there. He knows who I'm talking about. We had a conversation with the team. Look, we need you to write these commandlets. Screw off, we're busy. They're like they're small. Screw off, we're busy. Anyway, so this continues to happen at Microsoft. You know, you think Microsoft more money than Creases. You know, can, lots of resources. Turns out it's not at all true. Uh, they run the environment in such a way that it's very, very hard to get code written. Um, and so we knew to be successful, we need to have this value proposition that the commands would be as small as possible. Uh, we wanted to compose things with object pipelines. And we want to have these management models. Now really we're starting to see the management models emerge now, uh, last couple releases, where we basically have a very well-defined uh, view about how to, how to solve a particular space, and we schematize that and support that. We'll talk more about that. And then managing GUIs layered on top of, of automation. So this was the original uh, uh, component diagram, and it's shockingly accurate. I, mean, I think if you were to ask anybody from the team today, hey, write me a component diagram, it would pretty much look like this. So we had the separation between the parser and the script execution engine. If you've ever used, we'll talk about this later in the week, but um, in my GIA talk, there's no language mode. When you connect to a remote machine, that remote machine can be in full language mode 
or no language mode. When it's no language mode and you're typing things, when it's a full language mode, you type things, you send the, it over to a remote parser, it parses it and hands it to the execution engine. When you're talking to something that's locked down, it has no language mode, and you type some scripts, uh, in fact, it's the local parser that's parsing the script. It sends over a data structure to the remote script e engine. Okay, so we had that separation from the very beginning. Separation between the engine and the hosts. Um, you, know, you have a console host, GUI hosts, a remote execution hosts. And then this separation of the commandlets, you know, base commandlets that we write, platform commandlets, host commandlets. Host commandlets, like there's a set of commandlets that are only available to ISE versus um, uh, server manager, things like that, automation <coughs> commandlets. Everything then having a log that the script execution engine can go over to a remote host engine that then talks to a remote instance of itself. Here we did uh, SOAP HTTP. We never got around to DIME THTP, or DIME and TCP. Uh, but then everything was then based on this extended type system, which could then deal with .NET, WMI, ADO, et cetera, and have third-party type extensions. So this is uh, shockingly accurate. Now, again, the point about this uh, economics and the traditional way of doing things. So if you take a look at the dev and test costs versus the number of functions I get delivered, I mentioned to you spent $4 million to get 60 commands, right? These were done in the traditional approach, right? Where there's a little bit of, of library routines written that were used across all of them. But by and large, every time I wanted a function, I had to invest in code, right? So pretty steep cost, right? And this is the traditional Linux model, right? There's very little coverage, uh, very little leverage in writing a, a Unix commandlet. That's why they're so hideously um, inconsistent. Because <coughs> every time somebody does something, they do it afresh, right? That's why, for you Linux guys, what does the uh, dash L parameter mean on a commandlet? Uh, dash P? Dash S? Right. Can't answer that question. That's a stupid question. It means nothing, right? Uh, PowerShell guys, what does dash confirm mean? <laughs> right? what, if, what about what if? Anyway, okay. How about dash path? Okay, right? We have consistency. Anyway, the Unix world has no consistency, and therefore the dev and test cost for big coverage is very, very expensive. Instead, what we did is we invested in a common engine. Right? So we made this investment in the common engine that then is going to apply to everything. And then the incremental cost for a function is really, really, really quite small. It's really small. And the point about this common engine then is, I can invest more, and the value goes up and up and up at no cost for these guys. And so that's really what's happened, right? You write a commandlet, and here are some of the things you get for free, right? We do the parsing, parameter validation, help, type coercions, pipelining, ubiquitous parameters, logging, the object utilities, where, sort, group, the formatting, format um, table, list, etc., outputting to various things, convert, XML, CSV, JSON, uh, exporting, implicit remoting, uh, proxies, and just enough admin, and then some more richer subsystems, <coughs> things like remoting, workflow, jobs, proxies, IntelliSense, desired state configuration. Again, the point is, you write this, and all this stuff is stuff you get for free. So it turns out that for developers, the, the deal, I write this code, here's what my customer gets, is incredibly powerful because of the architecture. And uh, that's not the same in, in some of the more traditional architectures. So I thought I'd give a, a report card on how we've done. So I break down the five areas that we talked about. I hope that's five. You know, the automation model, the shell, the management models, remote scripting, and the console. So the console, uh, here, the version one, we had a REPL loop, you know, just the console engine, pretty, pretty sad console host, we know that, watch that space. The automation model was a, a big success. We had, you could write commandlets in .NET or, um, yeah, well, in .NET, and we had our basic type adapters. The big investments were in the <coughs> shell, 
object pipelines, the utilities, the language, big investment there, the ability to write functions, the debugger, the security model. And in terms of the management models, here we just had one, and that's namespaces. Now, let me explain that. So again, the management model is where we say, for a particular activity, here's the way you should solve that activity, and then plug into that. So we said was namespaces, we want to have a uniform way to deal with file systems, the registry, um, certificate store, uh, etc. And so we do that, and you know, that's why you can CD into the registry. For remote scripting, all we had was WMI. So it was a, a pretty pretty solid uh, first version. And version two uh, really made some huge advances. Uh, we introduced the ISE. We now get PowerShell remoting, transformational. In terms of the management jobs, we added jobs, or sorry, management models, we added jobs. We were really just starting here. We just had background jobs and the eventing. The shell, we continued to advance. We had data language, splatting, try-catch, block comments, script internationalization. And then the big advance in V2 was the script commandlets. Uh, that's, you'll see, was able, allows us to do so much more. Uh, the comment-based help, modules, support for transactions. So version two was really quite a big release. And then there was version three. Version three was really the crossing the chasm release. The reason for that really is this uh, CDXML. CDXML is the ability to um, drive uh, the generation of commandlets based upon data structures. And the commandlets that we generate are these script commandlets. And the things that we generate them against are now native code WMI providers. So it turned out that there was a whole bunch of the Windows team that just wanted nothing to do. Or really, I'd say, it wasn't so much they wanted nothing to do. They could not accept the design ramifications of .NET. I'm some kernel guy. I can't go putting .NET stuff in the kernel, right? And being a kernel developer, yeah, there's, I could kind of layer some stuff, but I'm really not a .NET developer, et cetera. So what we did was we said, hey, if you write WMI, provi if you write WMI providers, and by the way, I've got a brand new way to do that, far simpler, I can auto-generate the commandlets using CDXML. I'll generate script commandlets for you. That's what allowed version three to cross the chasm in terms of coverage. This is where we went from like, what was it, 240 commandlets to like 2,400 commandlets, okay? Largely because of this, this capability. We had the ability to write commandlets in workflow. Here we... Why do you think that teams were so much more open to writing a bunch of WMI providers for CDXML commandlets? versus the Wimic days when it was a hard start for the, essentially the same WMI providers. Yeah, why were they writing WMI providers now versus before they weren't? Um, again, there's two reasons. One is WMIC wasn't particularly, uh, wasn't adopted very much, whereas PowerShell was adopted. So when you did something, there were people asking for it. And the second was the WMI V2 provider model. In WMI V1, you know, you had to have like, how many people here have PhDs? Yeah, you guys aren't smart enough. Uh, you need to have like a triple PhD and be, you know, intricate with calm, blah, blah, blah. It's just hideous, hideous, hideous. With PowerShell V2, what we said was, hey, let's start with the schema. You define the schema. In fact, we had a tool that says, let's start with the commandlets. And from the commandlets, here's what the task model is. That then produces your WMI schema. And then we had a tool that took your WMI schema to generate your uh, providers. So it actually generated all the code for them, and then they just filled out the templates. So it was very, very much uh, easier. In fact, the networking guys had said, uh, we wrote V1 providers and we wrote V2 providers, and the V2 providers were at least 10 times easier. So that was the real reason. So a bunch more work in the <coughs> shell, kind of things here, DLR, uh, we actually do now on the spot, hot spot compilations of your code. We have the AST, we picked up the web and JSON support, better SIM support. In terms of the management, we fleshed out jobs with scheduled jobs, WMI jobs, workflow jobs. Remoting, we made much more robust, connect and reconnect, run as, constrained endpoints, PowerShell web services, PowerShell console in a browser, 
in the GUIs. We added snippets and telesense. Um, great stuff there. Then in version four, this was the R2 release, 2012 R2. We had save help, uh, the where operator, big start, starting investment in desired state configuration. By the way, from here to here was three years. From here to here was what, one, one year? A little less than a year. But we still did a whole bunch here. Uh, added workflow debugging. And now, version five. And this is version five that we can talk about, okay? Uh, there might be some more stuff coming. <coughs> Uh, but in terms of the automation model, now you can do OData commandlets, which is to say that you can write um, commandlets using a REST API on a Windows or on Linux, and we will auto-generate the commandlets for you. In order to do that, you have to use a set of conventions we call OData. We have PSGET. This is allows us to go out and find PowerShell artifacts and bring them down to you. You can set up your own repositories, or we'll set up repositories for you. Uh, in terms of the shell, we're adding classes. We're adding classes. Uh, we're improving our transcripts and our logging dramatically. We're adding convert <coughs> from string. This is the great stuff that does uh, parse by example and start parsing by prayer. You can parse by example. I think we're gonna we're gonna show them that. I'm gonna show you. You're gonna love that. You're gonna see a bunch of this stuff this week. The big investment is in desired state configuration. That's where we're putting all of our weight. In fact, classes, classes is going to take us quite a while to fill. And when you think classes, you're probably thinking A or B or C or D. There's a lot to classes. We're implementing classes to the degree to which it makes us easier for us to implement desired state configuration providers and then go from there. We're investing in top of rack switches and the ability to command, manage those directly from Windows. We have OneGet, which is a sister of PSGet, and this gets things like IT Pro artifacts, like uh, browsers and sys internal tools. So this is more PowerShell artifacts. This is more IT Pro artifacts. And in um, PowerShell ISC, we now add remote editing. So if you've entered PS session to a remote machine, you can say, you know, you dir around, and when you say PS edit, we'll bring that file back, edit it locally, and then save it remotely. By the way, the other thing we're going to do here, and it's not available yet, but I'm just going to bet somebody's job on it, is you've seen show command. Show command only works locally. Now, show command will work remotely, and it'll work against constrained run spaces. So when you connect to a constrained run space, we'll find the commands that you're able to run, show those in show command, you can type them and execute them against remote machines. So when I step back and this is kind of a, hey, where were we, where are we, where are we going? Part of that is to be honest about where we've done well and where we haven't done well. And as I said, step back, I'm actually pretty pleased about the, the quantity of things that we've done that I thought were really kind of transformational. These in the uh, green are the things I think have really transformed things, really moved the ball forward. I think there's many others here that have the potential to, but that haven't yet. Um, but as you see, that's actually a pretty darn good track record. Now, in, to be fair, let's talk about the things where we didn't do as well. I think didn't, you know, bets that we made that didn't play out. And it turns out there's really only two, in my opinion. You might have a larger list. The data language, uh, we use it, but it's not used the way we had originally intended to be. We had hoped that uh, it would be a security layer. And the idea was this. A lot of what you do in code um, is, is represent data. If we could give you a data language where you could look at that and say, hey, that's just data. I don't have to evaluate any security risk of that. You know, so here's a thousand line script. 900 lines of it are data. I don't have to evaluate those 900 lines of, of data. I just have to look at the code itself, 100 lines. That's what we were going for. It turns out that it's very, very hard. We didn't, I, we didn't, I didn't appreciate how hard it was. So the data language isn't a strong security layer. It improves security, but it's not a strong security layer. Uh, so that didn't work out as well as we'd like. And transactions, I'm still quite bullish on transactions, but just in terms of, if we're being honest, uh, there's not a lot of people using transactions. And I think the DevOps philosophy uh, moves us away from transactions. Uh, the DevOps philosophy is very much more of a mindset that said, hey, 
And if something goes wrong, just clean slate the machine and start over again. Okay. Um, so anyway, there's my list of things I thought didn't have as, as big a transformation as, as the others. Steve? Uh, so you mentioned Excellent question. The question was, hey, we're investing so heavily in DSC, you know, why? What's the big motivating force here? And really, it's a race against chaos. Um, the DevOps world um, uh, is moving, and there's a bunch of DevOps tools, and they're coming onto the Windows platform, and honestly, they're kind of screwing up my ecosystem. Uh, and so what I need to do is to not let my ecosystem get screwed up. I need to get ahead of the power curve here. So what's that actually mean? But these guys with their heads and their hearts in the right place, when they try and take their tools and work them on Unix or on Linux, on Windows, um, they don't work. They just don't work. So then what do they do? And the answer is, oh, they go off and they have, you know, uh, chef extensions or puppet extensions or Aditi extensions or groundhog, ex ground diff, guard dog <coughs> extensions, etc. They have their own provider model. And they're off, and that's fine, to degree to which they want to go burn their own money and, 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 and do that. But what they're then doing is to my partners, and they're saying, hey, go write my extensions. And so to degree to which you write extensions, great. Then somebody else is going to come and say, oh, now write them for me, and now write them for me, and now write them for me. And maybe you've got some for, to support one guy, and you support somebody else. And now my customers are going to look there, and they're going to say, hey, I want a configuration management product. And now I've got to pick my configuration management product based upon who manages what. Well, that's just a, a lousy deal. What we want to do is we want to provide a platform so that all these guys can get their job done. We want to say, we will go evangelize to our entire ecosystem. Here's how you plug in desired, desired state configuration. And then all the tools can, do, can take advantage of that uniformly so that you can then go purchase your tool based upon these guys have a better GUI, these guys have a better workflow, these guys have better reporting, these guys are faster, et cetera. Not that guy got to the exchange team first and got a set of providers versus this guy got to the SQL team, except, oh God, I got to support both SQL and exchange, right? So there's, uh, if I don't get ahead of this and get this platform out there ubiquitously, uh, I'm going to have chaos in the ecosystem and it's going to hurt my customers. So that's why desired state configuration is such an important thing and why we're investing in it as a, as a platform play. So again, the platform is we define a platform, have everybody in the ecosystem that has something to be configured plug into it, and then, any, and then our customers can choose any configuration management tool they want <coughs> and be assured that it's going to manage everything. Why do you think those config management tools are, are appearing to gain so much traction? Oh, why are they? Why are those tools gaining so much traction? And I think it's the move towards DevOps. So DevOps really does take a. If you're not keened in on the DevOps philosophy, do we have a talk about DevOps this week? If yeah, not, we should. We should. Yeah, we're, we're touching on it in various places through the, the week. Oh, great. So we will have some talks on DevOps. It's a very different approach to um, uh, IT. You know, it's, some people say it's a very different approach. Some people say that's what we've been doing all along. Uh, but it's a very solid thinking uh, that's really transforming IT and uh, gaining popularity. And it turns out that some tools help you support that. You, tools. It's not about tools, but some tools help. But you, you had a question. Yeah, on the uh, top of rack switching, uh, what's driving that? Is that our providers driving that? Is that you guys betting it's required? Is that SDN? What's driving uh, top of rack switch management? Basically, w you see a switch to uh, we're now, we want to manage everything. It really starts in the cloud. There's two layers to the cloud. The cloud fabric, I need to be able to manage raw hardware, top of rack switches, storage devices, uh, and the compute of that. And then there's the tenant space. You know, the one thing that's useful to get in focus is that for Microsoft, we make more money in Azure if you have 10 instances of Linux than if you have two instances of Windows. Okay, it's important to understand. From our business perspective, I make more money if you're running 10 instances of Linux than two instances of Windows. 
What that means is it's a volume play. It's a volume play. So I've got to eliminate any friction to you being able to consume as much management as possible. It's one of the reasons why the desired state configuration is on Linux as well. It's why we want to, it's different, it's from the fabric play is why you need to be able to manage the top rack switches. From the fabric play, that's why we had invested in the management of SMIS uh, devices. So we've got commandlets to manage SANS. That's what's going on there. Yes, sir. Are they uh, any of these that, are, that uh, I want you to promote? My, I'm very pragmatic about this stuff. Uh, you know, the, the, the things that help you get your job done, you should encourage, you should promote. If it's not helping you get your job done, it doesn't help me. It's all about you, it's all about you guys. Now I will say I think this is where I can use the most help, the desired state configuration. Uh, you know, try that out. Let us know where we're not doing well. Let us know. Uh, you know, Steve, by the way, we have a great relationship with Steve when he was at Stack Overflow before he screwed us and left, went and got a better job. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was the point where, hey, if, Steve's d if Steve calls, stop what you're doing, answer it, because he's using our stuff in production. So that's a real world signal. And so if he's having problems, we want to figure out what the problem is and address it very, very quickly. So we're very motivated to get this desired state configuration done well. Yeah, just off the back of that, on the DSC, are you getting clients from the product groups? Because we've all got our scripts to preset up environments. I've got one for Link, there's one for SharePoint, there's one for Exchange. That seems like an ideal place for DSC. Yeah. I'm guessing it's going to get real traction when the Exchange team go, this is the DSC for an Exchange sets up. Yeah, the question is coverage within the rest of the Microsoft product groups. There's two answers. One is, um, it'll take we're early days of desired state configuration. The desired state configuration is on the uh, uh, path to be a con common engineering criteria for next r next year. We right now it's a uh, I forget what we call it, like a probationary or a heads up common engineering criteria. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of people are are seeing this. Uh, we're getting a lot of support from the people in the field. We're actually trying to take those products and get them deployed. So you'll see in our desired state configuration resource kit a whole bunch of things, especially next month. A lot of those were done by the those teams, field people, not the product teams themselves. But yeah, you'll see that. One small question, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this, but uh, would you see if desired state configuration would uh, get a very much bigger role in config manager for Microsoft? Desired state configuration versus config manager, SCCM. Uh, we're very, very, very much focused in on two things, server scenarios and DevOps scenarios. And SCCM is much more focused in on sort of enterprise-y scenarios and more heavily toward uh, desktop scenarios. Uh, at some point you might see more overlap, but, but that's where we are right now. Where does this fit in with uh, group policy? <laughs> group policy. Well, if you go on the basis that you could use DSC as an extension or to replace group policy completely. Yeah, we're, uh, can you use DSC as an extension to group policy or replace it completely? Yeah, um, let's see. I'd also then say we're, we're sort of working on that. In fact, the, the program manager for group po for desired state configuration is the program manager for group policy. Mm -hmm. So he thinks a lot about that. But honestly, uh, when you think through servers and you think through DevOps scenarios, um, you know, group policy is not a big strong play there. So that, that I think is the answer. In fact, that's sort of where it started was I had a conversation with somebody and, and he said, it was running some websites or some, one of our services and he's talking about a problem and I said, well, that's why we have group policy. And he says, are you kidding me? Those semantics don't work at all trying to run a service. When I make a change, I need to know when it changed, not that it might change over the course of time. I need to know immediately when it changed and uh, have fine-grained control over that. So is that actually one of those conversations that made me realize, eh, we have a problem here. So not saying that these things, you know, I would discourage any thinking about this kills that, right? So th that's where you end up in trouble, right? When Microsoft said, ah, now we have the GUI, that'll kill off the command line interface, that was just a mistake. That was bad thinking. It was a mistake. It's a mistake that's taken me, you know, 14 years to try and unwind. So it would be a mistake to say, 
oh, desired state configuration is going to kill off group policy or it's going to kill off SCCM. The answer is it's going to add a tool to the mix and then things will shift. Yeah, um, so two things, I guess. We're doing exactly that and what's working really well for us, um, killing off parts of group policy with DSC. Um, it's really good. Uh, oh. The other thing is, uh, it's more of a question of, of DSC in the future. Um, DSC, I've seen a lot of commandlets like the uh, like X computer and X AD user um, and all, uh, a lot of like Azure things as well. And these are all things that are managing remote systems from a single system. Um, are we going to be able to, in the future, apply DSC configurations in parallel to like a single machine? So if you want to provision a virtual machine, for example, using the, um, the virtual machine provider, you can only create one at a time, but in a scenario, like a yep. cloud provisioning scenario, you might want to provision two. Yeah. Um, yep. And if you're queuing them, it takes half an hour. So when you start queuing multiple requests, it takes a long time. Is there a roadmap to do that? Okay, it's, well, it's going to be tough to repeat. So he said <laughs> he, in fact, in his scenario, is using desired state configuration to replace some of the scenarios where he's using group policy. He mentioned the, hey, I love desired state configuration, but when you apply it to machine, uh, each one of the resources is happening uh, serially, uh, and in a lot of cases, they could happen in parallel. In fact, that was the design, was if you take a look at desired state configuration, you have a list of things, and then you have uh, dependency graphs. And the point about the dependency graphs is, you know, with the exception of the dependency graphs, you can run everything in parallel, subject to destroying the performance of your system. <laughs> so that, that the intent was to be able to run things in parallel. Right now we're running serially just because it's early days. And I don't know if we have plans to, to fix that in version two or subsequently to be able to do multiple things in parallel. But that's well, definitely part of the design. I was more thinking being able to s apply multiple configurations. So you think like oh. a request comes through to provision a new machine, five minutes later another request comes through to provision a virtual machine. Um, but you've already got one start DSC configuration running, and you want to run another one. Okay, so you actually you wanted to do something different. So one, you get this nice capability coming down the pipe where you're able to do things in parallel, but he's really talking about being able to do serially, I want to do this, and then I want to do that, etc. The answer is no. Um, from a particular source, there's a desired state configuration, and if you want, we're going to go make it so. If you want a new version, that's fine. We'll take the new version and make it so. If we're already doing something, your choice is to wait or to stop what we're doing and restart it. There is, however, what's coming in is something called partial configurations. Partial configuration says, I can accept configuration sources from multiple locations. So you can control the configuration of the firewalls. You can control the configuration of networking. You can control configuration of security, uh, and that these can come from different at different points. Uh, just a ten-minute scenario. I'll show. The I think the uh, that scenario might fit an orchestration tool better, something like SMA. Uh, it's meant to automate some powerful workflows. Um, it's a, a lot of it's about the right tool for the right job, and if you're looking to deploy mass amounts of servers, perhaps uh, declarative config management tool isn't necessarily the best tool for that job. And I'm all about DSC, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, it, it is, there is uh, definitely you know, kind of, sort of the right tool for the right job. Yeah, so uh, Steve was pointing out, hey, figure out the right tool for the right job. I want to highlight that. I think desired state configuration is really going to be a learning process for us all. I mean, I've got people in other parts of the company that know the exact line between where you should be declarative and where you should be imperative. And I'll tell you, they're full of crap, right? <laughs> Nobody knows that, right? And I think we're going to explore that together. Hey, what are, when are the benefits of being imperative? When are the benefits of being declarative? Uh, what's the right level of abstraction? Hey, uh, what's the benefits of the fine grain versus the larger grain? When are the benefits of fine grain versus large grain? These are all things I think we're going to explore as a community. I, encourage, I want to be clear about that. There isn't good guidance out there. There's guidance out there, but you should go experiment and then uh, share your observations. Share the, hey, I think we ought to do this, this, and this so that we have a nice public debate. 
you know, this is one of those things about, you know, you have a tool, you know it's useful, but what's the best practices for using that tool? It will take us a while to figure out. So I'm going to move on a bit. Last question I'm going to move on. Yeah, so how does that your lab environment acceptance and correction? How does desired state configuration work with a deployment pipeline? Uh, in fact, it works extraordinarily well with the deployment pipeline. We are working, you know, hand in glove with Microsoft's uh, deployment pipeline product. Um, and we are the mechanism for that. And you'll see in, in as you drill into PowerShell, we already have a desired state configuration, we already had support for that, separating out the structural information from the environmental information. So the structural information would be things like I got a front end, a back end, a mid tier, and the environmental information would be things like front end has five instances and here are their names uh, for a test environment versus the development environment it has two and here are their names versus the production environment it has 500 and here are their names. So we separate out the environmental from the structural and that's sort of one of the key things if you look at continuous deployment, continuous integration, that architectural separation is key. So yeah, we, I don't know, I don't think we have a talk on our continuous deployment um, uh, efforts, but. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the separation of the environment tomorrow. There you go. Steve Morosky is going to educate us. <laughs> so if you take a look at the PowerShell, I'm going to zoom back to the manifesto because I'm going to run up a time here in a bit. Oh, what time do I end? Ten minutes. Ish. Ish. We started you early. Yeah. Oh. Because you're, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that meant I get to, to go later now. Okay, anyway. So when you read the document here, I'm going to just kind of highlight some things. You read the document, and I was very crisp about what we call these market relevant statements. And what we'd say is for audience who qualifier, the product, PowerShell, uh, what the value proposition was. And then unlike the alternatives, <coughs> product, what the differentiators are. I encourage you to read the document. This is just a wonderful way to describe what it is you're trying to achieve and then to measure yourself, did you do well or not. And then here are the audiences we picked. Application developers, application testers, admins, power users, and GUI users. I'll zoom through this and then talk about futures. So, um, so for application developers, I think this has worked out really well. Uh, you know, .NET's awesome, but the reality is, is that the world continues to balkanize. That's why we had to support .NET, or sorry, native code. That's why we had to support uh, REST APIs. Uh, we expect no consolidation in the developer space anytime soon, and therefore our flexibility and the ability to generate script commandlets was one of the most important architectural things we ever did. Because we can, if something has enough structure, we can inspect it and generate the commandlets. That's why we like OData versus random REST APIs. Random REST APIs, there's nothing to, there's nothing to work against. OData tells us enough about it, we can generate the commandlets. There remain lots of cultural issues. Um, you know, people don't get the developers, or developers don't get the programmers, or sorry, operators. They don't have an administrative point of view. We see this decreasing as more and more developers start to run their own code. Side note, one of my major disappointments, one of my personal uh, disappointments is my complete and utter failure to drive diagnostics in my 15 years at Microsoft. Guess what? Now, as Microsoft is running its own software, people are saying, hey, you know what? We need diagnostics, to which I reply, you're a genius. You figured it out. How can I help you? Uh, <laughs> But for the 15 years I was telling them you needed diagnostics, it was going nowhere. But as soon as Microsoft engineers start to run their own software, and you see it happen more and more and more, the right things begin to happen. Diagnostics, administrative thinking, et cetera. So optimistic there. We continue to have poor tooling support. Um, and what we're going to do here now is to, one, we're going to shift our focus and focus more on developers. You'll see in the original manifesto, I talked about wanting to have a tool that spanned, a single tool that spanned both developers and operators. In reality, we've been heavily focused in on the operator standpoint. 
each release we have more and more developer stuff. Try catch was more developer, trap was more operator. In version five, we're making a heavy shift to provide more support for developer sensibilities. And you'll see that with the classes work. And by the way, a bunch of you are gonna love it as well. But the degree to which I can seduce more developers into PowerShell community, these are the guys that will then fill out the long tail of, of tools and functions that we need. And then we're supporting classes, PowerShell Get, etc. So much more of a focus in on developers. For the testers, um, this has worked out pretty well, very well actually. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to have more public support for a test framework for scripts. I think Jim Truer is going to talk about that. Uh, we think that at some point somebody said, oh my god, SharePoint Online is being run entirely by a half a million lines of PowerShell script. Where are the tests for that code? <laughs> so it's a very interesting point. So you know, we want people to say, hey, it's fine to be running your online <laughs> services with half a million lines of PowerShell script and not freak out about that. Why? Because we ought to have a bunch of tests and uh, best uh, script, best practice analyzers to be able to practice that. You know, analyze your scripts, and make sure everybody's doing things the way you want them to be. So more formalism, less ad hoc. In terms of the administrators, um, this has worked out very well. Uh, the object stuff really has driven simplicity. However, in the Unix, in the Windows world, I just got a ton of click next admins. Right, whose really only value is that they figured out how to hit this left mouse button, right? Next, next, next. And, and honestly, I'm just sort of done trying to help those guys. We invested <laughs> heavily in simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. And uh, you know, some folks are gonna get it, and the others aren't. And we're sort of done. We're gonna invest more for people like you in this room to take whatever, you, you've obviously passed through the knot hole. We're gonna make it, we're gonna focus in on you, not on them. You know, desired state configuration is really their last hope. If they can't like figure things out with that, then my guess is that their jobs are going to go away, and their operating system, their work is going to go to the cloud. And I can tell you more about why that is. So, power users, blah, lots of great stuff. Big wins in the syntax, the pipeline, the object adapters. Just feel really good about all that stuff. Access to all the APIs. The remoting the job help feel really good about that. But at the end of the day, still coverage is what determines success. <laughs> if you don't have the command like coverage, it's hard to be successful. So that's why 2012 was such an important release. As you and your your partners and your customers and your friends leave 2003, don't get them on 2008. Get them on 2012. It'll be a world of difference. Um, the error handling is super powerful, but it's often confusing. We really need to have a better tie-in between our error, errors and uh, the ability to get information online. Like the fully qualified help, uh, qual fully qualified error ID, I think is a super important thing. I'm not sure how many people are actually using it for searching the way they should. Uh, so we should just make that easier. And in general, I think in terms of the ecosystem, there's just way too much friction in sharing of artifacts. Um, it just, and we'll fix that. You know, it's, if you have an artifact, how do you share it with everybody? It's just too hard to do right now. All right, I'm gonna zoom through these to get to the futures. Oh, well, here you go. Let's stop at this one. The shell console remains a disaster. ISC is actually pretty good, but the console's really, really bad. Watch that space. I think we're gonna talk about the next release of Windows at TechEd, or maybe even at the end of this month. Watch that space. Not announcing anything. <laughs> um, yeah, the ISC, uh, that's a reasonable, just enough authoring experience. Uh, and we ship the AST and the extensibility. That's really starting to begin to pay off. For people who have not met, Tobias, this is Tobias. He is the author of <coughs> ISC Steroids. If you've not seen ISC Steroids, I encourage you to, to get that, try that. It's a wonderful tool leveraging the AST. Would not have been possible without the AST. So those investments in tooling are really beginning to pay off. <coughs> so here's the futures. The future, where we're going, okay? Things are gonna move a lot faster, okay? So, yay. <laughs> Uh, since we released, what, 2012 R2, PowerShell version 4, 
And since then, uh, we introduced the Desired State Configuration Resource Kit. We brought the Resource Kit back. Uh, started the first version of that the day after Christmas and have shipped seven waves of the Desired State Configuration Resource Kit since then. That's pretty darn quick. We've had multiple preview and experimental releases of the Windows Management Framework. Now you should be clear, this is a different SLA than you get in the past. In the past, what we would do is we innovate on these technologies, we put it in the next version of Windows, and then make it available down level. Now what we do is we innovate in these managing technologies, we release them as a preview release on the latest version of the OS only. If you have a problem, we'll do a fix forward. We don't patch the preview releases. We do a fix forward. We have multiple releases of that. And then we put it into the OS and make it available down level. Okay, So we're going to be moving much, much faster uh, with our cycles. Now the benefit of that is there's a benefit and there's a downside. Benefit is you get early access to the bits. You can tell us things that work for you, things that don't work for you, in time for us to actually change them. The downside of that, in time for us to change them. We will change them. There may be breaking changes. That's why we put an X in front of the resources that says it's going to break. Uh, it's also not fully documented. Had some threads in the community about, oh, DLC is not fully documented. My friend, if you need a fully documented product, don't use the previews. <laughs> that's not for you. <laughs> you wait till the product's released. Then you get that. Okay, so that's the deal. It's a question? Yeah, uh, with the traditional N minus two support, uh, with moving faster, N minus two, when you have like a three year release cycle, that's like nine years worth of yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, backward support. When you're down to like a year, year and a half, now I'm at three to four and a half years yeah. instead of, uh, yep. you know, of coverage. Uh, is there any talk of extending that? Yeah, the question is, we typically do an N minus 2 backward level, backward thing, back down level support. As we release things more quickly, N minus 2 might not be the right algorithm. In general, what we try and do is focus in on the addressable market where our customers are, uh, and that drives things. So with that, we don't have an answer. Okay, don't worry, Don, this is my last slide. I see, I see that, that four brow starting to knit out there. Okay, so we're going to have better community engagement, uh, better helping you to be able to support uh, each other uh, and, and, and us. This includes community contributions. So we don't have this button down now, but I expect at some point in time, uh, your code will ship in Windows. Yeah, right, seriously. That we're going to have a framework where we'll be able to take community contributions and ship them in Windows. So no promises. These are These are guesses. Uh, we're going to focus much more on developers and the DevOps workflows. <laughs> and uh, the base assumption here, right, so what, what kind of motivates all this? And that is we just are firm believers that the more people compute, the better things are, right? And we believe that the, the natural level of computing has been artificially suppressed by various forms of friction. In the past, the friction was money. Computers were really expensive. Right now, computers aren't expensive, uh, and and virtual computers are cheap, and cloud computers are are <coughs> downright cheap. Right, but there's a new form of friction, and that new form of friction is in operationalizing things. Oh, I stand up a new server, click, 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 click. So you have operational friction. So what we want to do is we want to eliminate all the friction for you to be able to consume the optimal level of computing, and by doing so, we're going to benefit. And again, whether that computing is Windows or Linux, we're going to make it easy to, to consume as much as you want. That's, the, that's, the, that's where we start from. And uh, so it's our mission here, again, is to minimize the effort and risk to consume lots of computing. And so part of that, right? remember, we make, just as, we make more money if you have 10 instances of Linux than if you have two instances of Windows in Azure. So my prediction, this is a prediction, not a plan, not a promise, but part of my job is to, is to take a look at the world, take a look at the physics and say, here's what's going to happen. I think inexorably we're going to be forced to open source PowerShell and make it available on Linux. Why? Because if your customer decides, hey, I want to do this in Windows and this in Linux, we don't want to have this big barrier to that means this set of tools. Oh, that means that set of tools. Ah, that means I got to bring in these people versus I got to bring in those people. I want to say, hey, you guys are the IT pro experts. 
you know how to manage things. You know how to manage things whether they're Windows or they're Linux using the same set of tools. So that's, that's what I expect will happen going forward because it just drives my business. So with that, questions, comments? So does that mean that if Linux is on the horizon, you would consider Macs as well? Uh, would we support Macs as well? You know, whatever drives our business. Right yeah. now, not, I don't have a ton of Macs on. Because they're living on our horizon. Yeah? Oh. Um, largely, when I think about this, I think in terms of Azure, right? So there's no Mac in Azure. <laughs> that said, <laughs> on the server and the cloud. Yeah. And the cloud. Well, I'd say, you know, once, once you open source it, it's kind of going, it will go wherever it goes. Yeah. By the way, this question and answer, the fact that I had to zoom through a few slides is exactly the dynamic we're trying to get out of this summit. Do not sit there and say, oh, the guy's going through his slides, da 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 da. No, this, this engagement is what we're after, including, that's wrong. We love that. <laughs> More comments? Questions? All right. How does the uh, workflow fit in with the Azure model? Um, at the moment, we're starting to use the Azure pack very heavily. And of course, for automation, we need to use the workflows. Where does that fit into the, the grander scheme of things with Azure? Um, well, as much as possible, uh, we're trying to make Azure and on-premise as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are, you know, they were sort of, you know, Azure had a loose coupling with Windows. Uh, in fact, we did the work so that now, if you might have heard, the original version of Azure didn't use Windows. It had taken a snapshot of Windows and did Red Dog OS, where they did their own hypervisor. We got rid of that a couple years ago. Now it's based upon real Windows, exactly the same hypervisor. And then step by step by step, we're aligning these things. Uh, our executives have explicit goals and compensation rewards around uh, bringing these things together. Uh, one of our bosses, it's her explicit goal. She drives cloud consistency across things. So right now you'll see differences, but they are coming together. Speaking of consistency between on-prem and Azure, um, is there plans for any other on-prem things to use Windows Fabric other than the server? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 